So Parkinson's disease, so what is it? It's loss of these cells down on the midbrain that make this neurochemical dopamine. We don't know what causes them to die yet. We, we know there are some genetic causes, there are environmental causes. I'm not going to cover that specifically, and obviously the holy grail is to work out how we can stop these cells from dying and prevent them. That, again, is not the research that we're doing. A lot of very clever people are doing this at the moment. We're more at kind of at the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. What do we do after somebody's presented with Parkinson's and has been treated for a, a number of years with normal pharmacotherapy? But what actually happens here is a, a picture of a nerve terminal that makes, manufactures dopamine and releases it normally. And this is a one, one nerve terminal and one receptor. It's a protein that receives the dopamine and does what it has to do inside the cell, the signaling cascades within the cell. So normally things work very well. You take tyrosine in your diet. You manufacture uh, dopamine, and it sits in these little vesicles waiting for the neural signals that come along to trigger release so that it goes along and does its thing. So it's got a natural order of timing that's going on. But, of course, with Parkinson's disease, when you've lost these dopamine cells, we, uh, one of the things that we do, one of the mainstays of treatment, of course, is L-DOPA. And L-DOPA works extremely well because it's getting in there. It's basically what we'd say is reloading the trigger. It's filling up these vesicles uh, in the surviving terminals that are still there and working, and they can then release dopamine under the natural order of timing, which is why it probably works so well. But, of course, what happens there is a loss and a shortage of these. They are progressively dying off. So L-DOPA's got to find somewhere else to go. And one of the thoughts and theories is that it's getting into other nerve terminals that are not dying off, for example, the serotonin system, and releasing, that they can manufacture dopamine, but it releases it all at the wrong timing. Potentially, that's maybe why we end up with some of the, um, we can end up with some of the, the, the side effects from long-term treatments. This is obviously, you all know a lot about this and have experienced more than myself, but uh, dyskinesias or on-off phenomenon that can come from prolonged use of, of dopamine. So what we'd love, what you would love, is to have something that enables you to move without the side effects. So stave off the side effects lifelong. So that's really the ethos with which we started to look at this system. And even the dopamine agonists that are also good, used often in, I think, early therapy, particularly now, uh, work very well and very good for smoothing out symptoms. But you can also imagine they're not also going through the system. They're going straight onto the receptor, so they don't also respond to the natural timing. It may be why, because this is a reward chemical, it may be why there's some side effects related to reward uh, issues, the dopamine dysregulation syndrome, etc. So if you imagine this, this empty bucket here being a brain, I'm sure you know people who have got brains like empty buckets, but if you imagine this being a, an empty bucket here and you're giving somebody some L-DOPA pill, it's turned into uh, dopamine, but this is happening over a very long time scale. You're taking it four, five, six times a day, so you can imagine these very slow fluctuations in, on, in dopamine in the brain that are coming from L-DOPA. Now, when I was at medical school about 100 years ago, we were sort of taught that the reason that people get dyskinesias um, and ab abnormal uh, movements is that we're not driving these receptors all the time. They're being fluctuated up and down. We're not hitting them all the time. But the issue really with that thought, really, is that when you actually study the levels of dopamine in the brain in a normal animal um, and us in humans, uh, it really sits down there at very low levels. But with certain stimuli that may occur in the uh, environment, there's a sudden, what we call a phasic burst of dopamine. And that may only last a few seconds. Salient signals in the environment tend to cause this to occur. It's because the system is designed to learn. It's designed to learn things. It's designed to get you out of bed, to motivate you, but also to try and reinforce things that are useful. So one can imagine if, if with this kind of activity going on for a long period of time that you may be reinforcing movements that aren't that useful to you and possibly, theoretically, that's why dyskinesias, for example, may, uh, may, may, may occur. So we know that when you watch these dopamine cells tick and fire along in a, in a moving animal, they fire along at this sort of rate like a very badly timed clock and that is responsible for a very small, the small levels of dopamine here. But, as I say, these uh, salient stimuli that can occur in the environment and things related, even self-motivated, exercise can cause this to happen. Um, there are these bursts that cause these uh, rapid and short changes in dopamine. So dopamine cells you could think of as firing bursts in response to important events. And what we did some research a number of years ago um, where we looked at 
um, what those bursts do. What do they do? What does dopamine do? And one of the things that we found is that we played back those bursts into the brain of a rat, um, and we actually used it to drive the dopamine cells according to bursts that you would normally see. And then we measured, very, very complicated experiment, but we measured the strength of brain connections between the cerebral cortex and the basal ganglia, which is where a lot of this control happens. And what we found is when you apply those bursts, they strengthen these connections. They strengthen the movement-related connections. So it's not very hard to, to imagine when if you don't have those bursts, then you aren't going, you're going to lose a certain amount of movement function because you're going to lose the strength of your synapses. Similarly, if you have this long, slow, high fluctuating level, you may reinforce things that you don't want to. That's the theoretical basis for how this is um, coming about. And this is just to show you if you were to put a microscope in there and have a look, you would see these cells in the basal ganglia and you would see inputs from the cerebral cortex and they release glutamate, which is an excitatory amino acid, which makes these cells fire, excites them. And what the dopamine does is it modifies the strength of these synapses. It's now well known, lots of research on that. So really, what would be the rationale for developing a new therapy? So dopamine replacement that mimics natural bursts, this is how we, what we believe, uh, natural bursts of dopamine release may improve the duration of treatment without side effects. And potentially, now this is big claim stuff, but we have to start, we have to get you interested to know why we're doing this and, and why I get out of bed to want to do this every morning, is that wouldn't it be great if we had something to stave off dyskinesias and even potentially reverse established dyskinesias? Theoretically, if one can normalise the system, maybe we could do that. We would need it in combination with good physiotherapy to be able to try and reverse and stamp out some of the movements that aren't, uh, aren't useful. So to achieve this, you can imagine, you can't take a pill that will do phasic bursts, right? This doesn't, I don't know any way that can be done, but we did come up with a whole new approach to therapy. And what we've done is we thought about, well, why don't we have a dopamine agonist floating around in the bloodstream in one of these biological packages called liposomes? Basically, these liposomes are like little bits of a cell membrane. The cells that you have are covered in a membrane. You can take them, any chemist here will know, you can make them, and they have a core that you can package uh, uh, neurochemicals in, or chemicals in. Some things package very well, some don't very well, but uh, we can package a number of dopamine agonists in here. You float them around, they have an internal trigger. This is where the fancy clever stuff comes in, and it's not me, it's the chemist. Um, a little receiver, and with that receiver, you can imagine if it's remotely triggered, you could make them open up and release their, their dopamine in the, or the dopamine agonist in the natural timing that we require. And diagrammatically, of course, you're not going to have a computer sitting on your back to carry around, but you can imagine a little system which uh, actually generates these uh, controller, generates the timing here, and drives these liposomes to release the dopamine agonist. That's where we were back in 2008 when we first thought about it and thought, boy, we've got a long way to go. This has been incredibly hard, and we've almost given up so many times. And funding has been an issue with it too. But it's nice to say that at least we're at a stage now we can, we can move ahead. Here is our approach. This is a liposome, when you look at it under an electron microscope, and you can see that there is a, a trigger, a little trigger that we attach to each of these liposomes here, and what we use is we use ultrasound. Ultrasound is like a, a high-frequency energy wave that you can't hear. Dogs can hear ultrasound. These are, these are frequencies that are much higher than that. It's being used commonly for, to try and open up that blood-brain barrier, that area between, um, between the, the blood and the brain substance. That's a very protective element that tries to stop stuff from getting in there that could damage the brain. But now people are working trying to m make that permeable uh, so that you can put drugs in, for example, for cancers or for Alzheimer's, it's also being used. Well, we don't want to do that. We don't need to do that. What we do need to do is to get these guys under an ultrasound signal to break open just temporarily to allow some stuff out that will go into the brain and activate those receptors. And that's what we're aiming to do. First of all, we did a proof of concept experiment. You always got to start off to say what's well, worthwhile and then go to the funding bodies for money. So we did patch clamping experiments on slices of brain. You can see these are brain cells here. We used an ultrasound transducer to drive it. And basically what we did was we thought, well, okay, how do you see the effect of dopamine? You can't really see it. It's actually very hard neurally to see what it does, okay? But we can see the effect of glutamate, which is that excitatory um, chemical that makes the cell fire. 
So we thought what we'd do is we'd put glutamate in these liposomes, we'd, uh, we'd run it into the circuit here. Here is a neuron that comes out of, this, out of the striatum and the basal ganglia. We'd record from that, and then we'd blast the glutamate and see if we could see a response of that cell that might, as we might expect. And um, this is what we did find. We found when you hit the glutamate, we hit the ultrasound and got glutamate release, you saw something that resembles what we call a postsynaptic potential. So yes, we had found that biologically we could actually uh, release things from liposomes and get an effect. So that was good news. So now let's move to Parkinson's. Okay, We wanted to know, could we package epimorphine, right? which is a drug that many of you will be using to enable you to keep going. If there's, a, if there's some freezing, it may also be used for, uh, to, to maintain your control. So we thought if we gave epimorphine and let it float around the brain, we did this in rats who were um, anaesthetized, um, and we used an ultrasound transducer to blast the uh, liposomes that are floating around there to try and release the epimorphine. We put an a, a electrode in the brain to see if we could measure the epimorphine. And this is only like two years old, this data, but we would find that if we applied this ultrasound for about 10 seconds, we would see uh, um, a, a large phasic change in the level of epimorphine in the brain. And this was done through the skull. So now we know that we can put a transducer on the, on the brain of an animal, we can blast it, and we can see these phasic changes uh, like we want to emulate. This is kind of a diagrammatic, you know, I'm not going to make anybody wear headphones, you know, but it's just a diagrammatic way that you might think about how one day we might have something to go into humans. Really, the realistic thing is that we'd probably have to have a transducer that would sit under the scalp. It would be, be an operation done under local anaesthetic, apart from the fact like deep brain stimulation, for those of you who have that, um, there's a tunnelling of the wire that would go down into the chest for a wee transmitter. That's very similar to deep brain stimulation. So you could imagine a transducer sitting under the scalp. Um, now, in any treatment that we think about, we have to think about the risks and benefits and, and the, the things that you would get out as, as people with Parkinson's. The good thing about that it's non-invasive, we are not going to invade the brain, which is really good. Deep brain stimulation works well, but you do have, obviously, a risk of infection if you're going to go anywhere inside that brain cavity. But what one would have to have, because liposomes, nobody quite has discovered a way of making them last more than about two days uh, in the circulation, but I don't know that we've really needed to have the drive to do that development. Nowadays, we may have it. We may have it with this. We may be able to move that on ourselves. So when one would have to face the idea of potentially having an intravenous line there chronically. It's being done for a number of conditions. I know people with epimorphine have, have uh, cannulas in, in, in place to enable you to every couple of days to have the injection of liposome. But after that, really the controller itself would do its own thing. Um, we wouldn't give somebody necessarily a switch to do that because that would probably not, wouldn't be such a good thing. It would sit there and it would, it would give these phasic pulses to enable you to continue moving.